previously we put together the basic blocks for a DIY Arduino schematic. In this video, we're gonna make this PCB. Well, actually no, we're gonna make this one. Let's go build. Okay, so I've corrected a few things from the schematic episode. First, the push button needs to be normally open. Next, the crystal needs a value. I picked 16 megahertz. Also to be clear, the auto reset signal needs to be RTS to match the serial header. Lastly, I redrew the schematic with KiCad 4.07 stable, so it should be easier to open now. You can get all of these changes from GitHub, which will be in the show notes. Now that the cleanup is done, here's the board we're gonna make. I originally made this as a rectangle, but that was boring and pointless, so I decided to make it a triangle, which gives it three points. I'm calling it the Pyramiduino, even though it's a single triangle. Now, just like with the schematic episode, this video is not meant to be a KiCad or KeyCAD tutorial. I'm not going to speak step by step for this design. Instead, I'll talk about the process I followed and give you tips along the way. In the new schematic, I removed the barrel jack and replaced the 5 volt regulator with its 3 volt version. And I broke out all of the I.O. pins. Again, you can get this file from GitHub. Now that those updates are done, we can start the PCB design. But first we need to assign footprints. So for the passive parts, I'm going to make them all 0805s. The regulator comes in an SOT223 package, and for the main IC, I'm picking a QFN. Atmel calls it an MFN, but I think the footprint is close enough. That just leaves the header pins and the push button. Oh, and I also added the single pins, which will be the mounting holes on the PCB. Since I'm using KiCad, I need to generate a netlist for the PCB editor. This file will keep the schematic and PCB in sync if we need to make changes. Finally, we're ready to start our PCB. After loading the netlist, the parts are dumped into a pile, which we can use the distribute command to spread them out. Now I'm drawing the PCB outline. And you might be wondering, how do I know what numbers to type in? Well, I did some pre-work and drew the shape already, so I know what the coordinates are. In a short follow-up video, I'll explain this tip in more detail. One mechanical constraint is usually mounting holes, so I'm gonna place those now. Again, I got the coordinates from the sketch I already drew. The header pins will run along the edges of the triangle, so they need to be rotated. One tip in KiCad is that when you are rotating parts, the value shown is in hundreds and not tens. So for 30 degrees, you actually type 300. The next component is going to be the crystal and its load capacitors. Now, I don't want to rotate this 90 degrees and I don't want to keep typing in 450. So let's change the global setting to 45, which in this case, you actually type 45 instead of 450. Please don't ask me why, I don't know. Next up, I'll throw the decoupling capacitors around the 328. I'll probably need to move these to their final places later. I just want to get them in the general area. The 3.3 volt regulator needs to be near the 3.3 volt pins, which are on the bottom right corner. So it will go near this spot along with its decoupling capacitors. And almost last is the auto reset and push button. You see, I forgot to move the filter inductor for analog VCC, so let's place that now. The initial layout is done. Now, I do want to point out that this is my fifth time drawing this PCB. So at this point, I had a pretty good idea where the parts should go. So don't commit yourself to the first layout. It's okay to back up, revert, and move things around. Now I'm ready to start drawing some traces. In KiCad, trace widths are determined by the group each net or signal is placed into. Here I'm setting up the rules based on guidelines given by Oshpark, 
which is who's going to manufacture the PCBs. Here you can see the values they recommend in mils. For my design, I had to convert these to millimeters. In a design such as this one, I will only have two design groups, signal and power. I'm making the signal nets relatively small and the power nets just a little bit larger. First, we route the most critical signals, in this case, the oscillators net. This path may look funny, but it's because I'm trying to keep the length to both pads from the crystal about the same. Next up are the serial signals. I know from previous attempts, it gets tricky to route the 5 volt or VCC traces over to the 3.3 volt regulator, so I want to get those in place now. Okay, now I want to make sure AREF has a nice clean path to its I.O. pin, which makes the next logical one to route AVCC. The 3.3 volt pins are easy, so let's knock those out. I'm running the traces on both sides of the board here just to make sure that there's some extra copper between them. All right, now it's time to start on the I.O. pins, starting with the analog input. Whoa, what just happened? KiCad is trying to help, and because of the route I picked, it has determined that the best way to stick to the design rules and make the connection, it is to go crazy around the board. Instead, let's try routing A4 before A5 and see if we can make that work. At this point, I'm convinced I can get both signals to fit between this capacitor's pads. And since RTS and reset are static signals that only change during boot, I'm not worried about their proximity to A4 or A5. It looks like if we move R1 and C3 a little bit, we can get through. And yeah, great. Looks like that's going to work. Okay, again, KiCad is trying to help out with the routing, and for me, it's adding a few too many turns. So I'm just going to clean up these signals as we go. Now we get to some tricky routing for the SPI pins. My goal is to keep a clean pattern and to group the vias together. <sighs> Oops, starting to realize that the route for the 3.3 volt signal isn't going to work out. Let me pause for just a second. You might be thinking I'm totally ignoring the ground connections, and I am, and I'm not. The last thing I'm going to come back to is connecting the grounds, because I've got something cool in store for them. While connecting up reset, I am ending up with this funny zigzag on the last couple of signals, and I could have probably changed my routing to 30 degrees, but eh, let's just get this thing done. All right. Let's take a look around the board and make sure that all of the I.O. pins are connected. And it looks like everything is done. However, if I look down at the bottom of the screen, we can see that there's 39 unconnected routes. Remember when I said I was skipping ground? Well, now it's time to connect them, but we're going to use something other than traces. We are going to make use of ground planes. A ground plane turns the unused parts of a PCB into a ground connection. You might also hear these called pours, as in pouring copper. There's a couple of reasons to use a ground plane, such as number one, signal integrity. You get better ground loops or smaller ground loops because ground is available almost everywhere. Number two, it is much easier to just drop a via next to a part to connect it to ground. Number three is related to heat sinking. The extra copper helps to spread out heat generated by parts like the processor and regulator. Okay, so now that that's all said, let's go draw some ground planes. First, on the bottom of the board, we're going to create a polygon and connect it to, well, ground. 
I duplicated the fill or plane onto the top layer and copied the bottom's settings. Now we have a ground plane on the top and bottom connected together by places like these ground pins. You might be thinking the board is looking pretty good at this point. Well, check again. There are still eight unconnected routes. And the reason is that ground did not get connected everywhere. There are islands or orphans of the ground plane. Here's the first spot. One of the crystal's ground pads didn't get flooded, so that's an easy fix. Looking in this area, if we connect a via below the regulator, it'll connect these two orphan areas. Lastly, there's an issue with this chip. It only has 32 pins, but the footprint had 33. There's an additional pin to find in the package for the ground pad on the bottom. So I'm replacing it with one that I created, which connects the pad to pin five. Now we just need to connect those pads to the rest of the ground pins and include some vias to the ground plane on the bottom. Okay, I cleaned up a few more things and I got the design down to one unconnected net, which is super annoying. I can't find it anywhere on the board. When I run the DRC check, KiCad doesn't complain. And when I check for unconnected nets, I get nothing listed. So at this point, I'm going to assume there's a bug and just move on to cleaning up the silkscreen. First step was to label all of the IO pins. To keep the design a little bit cleaner, I left the ground pins unlabeled, which I might regret later. With the pins labeled, now I'm going to move the silk screen for each component around. I want to make sure that no vias or components cover up each of the designators. Now that those are cleaned up, I got to thinking, what about the bottom side? Here's a pro tip. Label the through hole components so you can identify pins when the board is flipped over. So here in KiCad, I'm just going to duplicate and mirror each of the labels on the IO pins. The last bit I need to add is a name along with a version number. Trust me, add a version number. I'm still bothered by the unconnected net, but I'm going to send the boards off to Osh Park anyway. If you want to try an exercise, download the board file and see if you can find the missing net. If so, leave a comment with where it's at. The next step in our DIY Arduino will be getting the boards back and populating them. Now, before that, I'm probably going to do a live stream and maybe another topic, so stay subscribed for updates. Remember, when your circuit isn't working, just add ohms. Hey, so... I played a couple of tricks with editing on the PCB design. In the video, I mentioned one unconnected net, but in the actual board I sent to Oshpark, there are two. So the file upload to GitHub has both issues. Can you find them? That's your challenge. Let me know where they are in the comments. And thanks for watching.